okay. Let me just give, yeah, just a couple more minutes. I see people coming, you know, one every second. Okay. Gordon, what's a macker? Hmm? Say that again. What's a macker? M-A-C-R. Oh, a macker. Master of the American College of Rheumatology. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're allowed to put it on your, you know, title. It shows you I'm not, I'm not a rheumatologist, I guess. Yeah. Keith, Keith just got to be a macker as well. Congratulations. <laughs> just means uh, you've reached a certain stage in life. Um, but, uh, yeah. Okay. So it looks like we have about 30 attendees on, which is around normal, so we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Division of Rheumatology Grand Rounds. We have Dr. Gordon Starkeybaum and Dr. John Sims presenting for us today. And I just want to remind um, of a couple things. Both Dr. Starkeybaum and Dr. Sims will take questions at the end of their presentations. And you will see at the bottom of your screen that there's both a chat box and a Q&A box. If you could please chat any questions that you have into the Q&A box, that'll help us organize it a little better. Um, and then Dr. Starkeybaum and Dr. Sims will read through those. And now I'm going to pass things off to our division head, Dr. Alcon. Okay, well, uh, I'd like to welcome you all, including uh, members of Bill Aaron's family, to this uh, second in the series of uh, Pioneers in Rheumatology Research at the University of Washington. Uh, today we're paying tribute to the late Paul Aaron, and we'll have the presentations by Gordon Starkebaum, who was former section head at RVA, and that will be followed by John Sims, who is former scientific director at Amgen Seattle. We'll talk more on the history and science of IL-1. Before handing uh, over to Gordon, I thought to just relate my most memorable interaction with Bill. Uh, when I was at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, Bill invited me for my first faculty interview outside of New York. And I didn't know that any form of civilization existed west of the Hudson River, but I decided to take a look. Uh, I was really impressed. Uh, Bill showed me not only the terrific science that was being done there, but he also took uh, pains to show me the museums, the Civic Center, and what a vibrant city Denver was. And then he sort of turned around and asked me a question. He said, uh, why do you do research? So I thought, you know, the obvious answer, I said, uh, I, I need to get grants to support my salary. And he looked at me with that very typical quizzical look, raised his eyebrows and he said, uh, no, it's because you want to satisfy your curiosity. And I never, I never forget, forgot that, and that was, he was, of course, absolutely right. And um, I think it's in that spirit, really, that uh, we, we, I, we'd like to hear from, from Gordon some of those personal experiences and from John Sims of his exploration into IL-1. So without further ado, Gordon, let's uh, hear about it. Well, thank you, uh, Keith, and good morning. And uh, I see Elizabeth Aaron is on, and good morning, Liz. Uh, good to see you here. What Keith and I thought would be appropriate for this lecture was to have two goals. One was to sort of celebrate the link that Bill had with the University of Washington and the Division of Rheumatology, and I'll expound on that. And the second was uh, to explore the experiments that led his insights to, uh, you know, find out that there was such a thing as the IL-1 receptor antagonist. And uh, so if, if this is not a deep dive, it's at least a swim in that pool. So the, uh, let's see, I need to go forward here. Here's a picture of Bill at, at the University of Colorado and when he was chair there. So the first aspect is education training and the first job of Bill's. And so he went to Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York, graduated in 1964, and then became an intern and a resident 
at the University of Washington. And importantly, his first job was chief of the arthritis section at what was then called Seattle Veterans Administration Medical Center. And just interestingly, I graduated from Columbia uh, six years later, 1970, interned at the University of Washington and uh, started as Bill's first fellow at Seattle VA in 1975. And so our, our paths are sort of mixed for sure. And at the time in the 1970s, uh, with Mark Manick as the chair of uh, the Division of Rheumatology, immune complexes were hot. Uh, that is to say they were a subject of great interest and in research. And here are a series of publications just to illustrate that. And in particular, you know, the, the idea of looking at uh, soluble immune complexes interacting with macrophages, these are rabbit alveolar macrophages, uh, was in several papers. Now, in case you forgot what immune complexes are, this is a brief uh, review. Here are is an IgG molecule uh, with the FAB antigen uh, combining site up here on the FAB and the FC portion back here. And the idea was that the antibody interacted with say the surface of a pathogen and then eventually would be interacting with the self, with this FC receptor on an effector cell, for example, a macrophage or monocyte. And in those days, we gave a lot of credence to how immune complexes were sort of formed, particularly using the system of rabbit uh, antibodies to human serum albumin. And, and so one of the things that you have to appreciate is that the pre precipitation, how soluble these complexes are, was very much influenced by antigen uh, antibody ratio. And at equivalence, they would be precipitated and at the other edges of the antigen or antibody excess, they would be more soluble. And that will come up in some of the uh, descriptions here. And the other part of it was the background of IL-1. So these are a very brief tour through IL-1 history, but I uh, just realized that in 1956, fever uh, was found to be caused by uh, something called endogenous pyrogen, a protein that was released by rabbit white cells in response to lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin. And this was described by Bennett and Beeson. Now just parenthetically, Paul Beeson ended his career as an distinguished professor at the Seattle VA hospital. And I had the great privilege of getting to know him for uh, the years that he was there. And when I showed him uh, later a paper describing the fact that IL-1 was in fact and endogenous or the endogenous pyrogen. I just recall how, how pleased he was. 1977, there was the description of mononuclear cell factor, uh, which induced synovial fibroblasts to produce collagenase and prostaglandin E2 by Dyer. And then shortly thereafter, there was the realization that a number of factors, mononuclear cell factor, lymphocyte activating factor, B cell activating factor, and endogenous pyrogen were basically all, all identical to what was then called the first interleukin IL-1. And so this is all probably knowledge to you. But so here's the experiment that I want to explore in some detail to just show you in this context what was going on. This was published in the Journal of Immunology in 1985. At, by this time, Bill had left the University of Washington and was the head of the division at rheumatology in Denver. And so the materials that are being used here are kind of standard what we did in those days. So human monocytes in this case, which are far more difficult to purify than say rabbit alveolar macrophages. The human monocytes were purified from hum human blood mononuclear cells that were prepared by a centrifugation over lympho prep, and then they were adhered to tissue, tissue culture wells, and the lymphocytes were washed away. And so then the monocytes were being stimulated by a lipopolysaccharide, or what was called PMA, 4-ball acid, which is a stimulus for uh, macro monocytes.
and then they were being stimulated by immune complexes. And these used the serum albumin rabbit anti-SH uh, system that I talked about. And they were either soluble or adhered to the tissue culture well. This was before IL-1 was re really uh, available as an assay. You couldn't buy a, a, a kit at that time. So the assays for IL-1 were bioassays. And Collagenase was one of them, fairly complex. They, they used newborn rabbit cartilage cultures, and then they incubated them with rat skin fibrils that were labeled with C14. And they used, he used murine thymocyte uh, cells to be stimulated or co-stimulated. And then the, the various proteins were separated by column chromatography and isoelectric focus. And they also, he also assayed for superoxide production. So here's the first figure on this paper. And shown in this column up here is the protein absorbance from this column. And so as you elute off in the various fractions shown down here, the, the size of the proteins that are eluted get smaller and smaller. And so you can see the protein peaks are all way up here. But when he assayed the the supernatant. So what he's done here is to feed the monocytes adhered to the tissue culture wells a fixed dose of lipopolysaccharide and seeing what happens. And this is the positive control. And so he gets a proliferation signal of thymocyte stimulation, co-stimulation with PHA. And he gets this nice peak here at about uh, uh, 18,000. And then if he assays for collagenase down here on, on the y-axis, and at this point uh, assays for thymocyte proliferation without PHA, and you'll see this is about an eightfold lower, uh, in assay, it, the, the level is eightfold lower, he gets peaks exactly coincident. And so something, so in other words, LPS is, is stimulating these monocytes and, and, and making what we could be uh, IL-1. And the second piece of this is, is separation by isoelectric focusing. We don't use this very often, but the, the idea is you apply a pH gradient to, these, to the fractions, and he gets exact uh, identical uh, peaks with both collagenase and prostaglandin, or thymocyte, rather, thymocyte stimulation. And by the criteria used at that time, this is basically a, a definition of IL-1. And so the, the results of these indicate that the activity from LPS-stimulated monocytes uh, has the size and characteristics of IL-1. And so then, of course, you can see in the context that I laid out, he's going to see what happens when he feeds these cells immune complexes. And this is a really interesting table. And so here's his positive control, and we've got chondrocyte stimulation and thymocyte proliferation over here, and he's looking at both supernatants and lysates of these cells. And, and the LPS, you know, causes a good signal, and all of these actors down here cause no signal. And so, uh, you know, adherent antibody, adherent immune complexes, uh, PMA, all of the usual suspects, fail to induce the production of, by these monocytes of anything looking like IL-1. And so he says, wait a minute, is my system not working at all? Is this, what's going on here? And so he basically repeats the experiment, but not using the LPS stimulation. He looks at whether these monocytes are actually producing superoxide using a, a, an assay that was uh, available. And, and so in this case, adherent antibody on the plates or adherent immune complexes both stimulate superoxide uh, production as expected the PMA. And so the conclusion here is that adherent antibody HSA or immune complexes and PMA all stimulated superoxide by these monocytes. That is to say, the system is, you know, the monocytes are doing their job. And then he 
dove in one layer deeper and they said, well, what if I add complement to these adherent immune complexes and look to see for the chondrocyte or the thymocyte proliferation assay. And here, if he uses immune complexes with guinea pig complement, he gets a signal. He gets the stimulation of IL-1 production as measured by chondrocytes or thymocyte uh, stimulation. And so the, the, this is a really interesting dichotomy. He's got, with complement, he can, he can see an IL-1 signal, but with immune complexes and no complement, as shown here, he gets nothing. And so now comes the crucial question, what's, what's going on? And so he postulates, Bill postulates, that maybe there is an inhibitor that's being produced under these conditions. And so this is a critical experiment here, which then he takes the LPS supernatant from uh, the monocytes being stimulated as the control for IL-1, and he adds, he takes that supernatant and he adds to it the supernatant of these various uh, immune complex preparations. And the critical observation was that monocytes that uh, cultured on adherent antibody, HSA, or adherent immune complex reduced the, the stimulation by the LPS supernatant uh, markedly. And in this experiment, he has obtained a recombinant IL-2 and fed it to the thymocytes and the supernatant from these guys does not inhibit that, whereas the supernatant inhibits the IL-1 uh, activity with thymocytes. And so the conclusion is that here, anti-HSA or immune complexes induces monocytes to release an inhibitor to IL-1, but not IL-2. And finally, then he gel filtrates the, the supernatant. He finds that up here is the IL-1 control, the LPS, and these are the various fractions from these columns. And in these fractions here, collagenase or thymocyte proliferation are markedly inhibited at a molecular weight of 22,000. So that is the experiment that says there's something being released by monocytes that uh, causes an inhibition of the IL-1 signal. Now we fast forward five years to uh, this, these two back-to-back -back papers in Nature. He's now, he's at the, at the University of Colorado, but he's working with a biotech company called Synergen up in Boulder. And so they set out to basically purify and, and clone this, uh, this product. And so here they use somewhat the similar, uh, it's, a, it's a called a mono-Q chromatography, the fractions. So when these monocytes are now placed, plated on just fetal capsaicin, there's no signal. But here with uh, radioactivity, you see peaks of both uh, the collagenase as well as a prostaglandin assay that coincide right here. And so then they show that with these IgG plate products, that when those fractions with those peaks, there is a signal here, but with radio labeling on an auto red, you see very strong signals here. And uh, they go on with reversed phase HPLC, which is a fancy way of really separating. They get three separate fractions that they designate a X, alpha, and beta, and they show that by silver uh, staining or auto rad on HPLC that these are fractions of about uh, 20,000 molecular weight. And they then digest these alpha and beta fractions with N-glycanase, and they show that they all come down to a a single product of 18,000 molecular weight, which indicated that the proteins uh, alpha and beta are glycosylated, but not the X protein. And so the next steps then are cloning of IL-1 RA. This was done at Synergen. The proteins were purified. You could see how purified they were. They were sequenced from the sequences of these various things. They 
constructed a, an oligonucleotide probe. These are standard, uh, if you're in this field, this, these are standard uh, approaches to this. And they uh, obtained a cDNA clone from human monocyte library. And this protein was uh, a unique protein, not in the database, 152 amino acids, molecular weight of 17,000, expressed in E. coli then that yielded what they called IL-1 receptor antagonist activity. And importantly, it had no agonist activity. It did not stimulate IL-1 production. And, and structurally, it was similar to both IL-1, alpha, and beta. And uh, these are interesting receptor competition assays. So in this case, they're using a cell line that has an IL-1 receptor and they can bind, they, they radio label IL-1 alpha, and that's shown in, in these boxes, cold IL-1 then inhibits it binding, and the IL-1, uh, recombinant IL-1 receptor antagonist shown here also then competes with it. And these three lines up here are the original three uh, X alpha beta proteins that also do this. And over here is shown a similar competition assay with S35 labeled IL-1RA. And it is being competed off uh, by both IL-1-alpha and IL-1-beta, as well as cold uh, recombinant antagonist. And interestingly, then they use another cell line that late, later turns out to have a separate kind of IL-1 receptor, and John Sims uh, may talk about this, and it does not, IL-1 receptor antagonist does not bind to this guy, but yet both alpha and beta uh, IL-1 uh, compete from it off. And so, it, and here's a structural graph showing the similarity between IL-1 RA and IL-1 beta. And so, basically at the end of this, what they've concluded is that IL-1-RA is a member of the IL-1 family. It's structurally related. It binds to IL-1 receptors. Uh, it occupies, but does not activate the receptor. And it's a pure receptor antagonist. And so here's a cartoon from uh, that time, a little bit later, by Brezhnehan. And the concept is activated macrophages can produce either IL-1, which binds to the IL-1 receptor. By this time, they have uh, demonstrated that the IL-1 receptor has an accessory protein, so it's a, it's a dual receptor. And when IL-1 binds to it, there is signaling, but IL-1 receptor antagonist binds to the receptor, competes with the IL-1, and no signaling occurs. And so this is actually the first demonstration of a pure uh, receptor antagonist that activated, that acts in this way. It, so that's remarkable in its, in its own right. And so at that point, uh, I will see if there are any questions or comments. So Dr. Starkeybaum, I'm not seeing any questions come through just yet, but there is a chat for you in the chat box. Oh, in the chat box. Let's see where's mm -hmm. my chat box. Ta-da. That may be over here. Chat. Can you read it? I can't even see the chat box. Um, yeah, it's just, it's from Woody and Mary Emlyn. Um, they just said, great job of reviewing things. Good to see you and anyone else who's there from the good old days at Seattle Rheumatology. Oh, good. Well, Woody Emlyn <laughs> was one of my uh, fellow compatriots and so, and Woody and have been uh, in Denver as well. Woody, thank you for being here. Yeah, they like your, your Colorado background as well. <laughs> That's Maroon Bill, so <laughs> Yeah. So if no questions come through right now, we could probably transition over to Dr. Sims. And then if more questions come in at the end um, that are possibly for your portion, we can answer those then. Here's a hand by Marianne Johnson. Go ahead, Marianne. 
Oh, let's see. Just one moment. I will hold on. I will stop share and. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Mar Marianne should be able to speak now. <laughs> okay. You're on mute, Marianne. Uh, this is. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> this is Richard Johnston. My wife is the expert in the uh, technology. So she signed us in. Uh, <clears throat> I, this is, uh, I thought a wonderful presentation, Gordon. Um, I, uh, it was a trip down uh, nostalgic uh, road for me. Uh, I did uh, monocyte and macrophage biology uh, research um, in, uh, at Rockefeller and then in, in Denver at National Jewish. And I watched what uh, Bill was uh, gradually developing this beautiful, beautiful story that uh, you presented. And uh, it was just a pleasure to see that again and to remember um, one of the assays I had, a couple of the assays that he used, I had developed. And um, what I would like to do now print, is the name of, of one or two people. Um, we became friends, and I had the greatest respect for Bill and the courage that uh, he exhibited uh, later in his life. So thank you, Gordon, for putting this together. Yeah, well, thank you, Richard. You, you're, you're absolutely right. These were, I buzzed <clears throat> through the uh, methods, but these were not trivial uh, experiments in terms of the complexity no. of the air which they had to be done. <clears throat> People worried a great deal about the presence of contamination of LPS in all the medium, and he met, you know, went to great trouble to make sure that wasn't the problem. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> That came through well uh, to anybody who's, who's had to try to make these assays work in, a, in the past. Right. Yeah. Well, good. We're, we're, we're constrained by time. There, this story could go on for a long time, but it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Sims, who's going to talk next. <clears throat> um, he graduated from Harvard with a PhD, and in 1984, he joined the staff at then Immunex here in Seattle as a molecular biologist. And John has 70 patents and 80 papers. And one of his most important papers was in uh, 1988, where he cloned the receptor for IL-1. And so his, his uh, expertise in this is, is uh, very well recognized and we're pleased that he's here. John? Thank you, Gordon. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Uh, let's see. I need to, I need to find, there we go. Okay. Um, Perfect. Oh, Looks good. Find... All right. So, um, Yes, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, R1, R1 receptor human disease. Uh, I should say I'm always reminded when I give a talk at the UW, but the first talk I ever gave here, it must have been 1988 or 89. And uh, my mother was visiting from Wisconsin, and she'd always wanted to hear me talk. So she came along, she sat in the back of the room, and I started giving my spiel. And about 10 or 15 minutes later, later I look up, and she's sitting there in the back of the room, sound asleep. <laughs> so that's not really what you hope for from your mother, and it's not what I hope for for Bill today, so I hope I do a better job than that for you. Anyway, here's Bill. Gordon's already uh, introduced you to his uh, education and career, um, and to the fact that Bill is best known for his discovery of the IL-1 receptor antagonist. Um, this was a pretty significant discovery, but in order to understand why it was so significant, we need to understand something about IL-1. So I'm gonna tell you about IL-1 and the molecules involved with uh, IL-1 communication and signal transmission in the first half of the talk. And then in the second half, I'm gonna to turn to its relevance for human disease and give you a few examples of areas in which IL-1 inhibition is turning out to be useful 
in treating patients. So IL-1 is a master inflammatory cytokine in the sense that it's at the head of a wide variety of various downstream cascades. And because it affects so many different processes, it originally was known by many different names, depending on what the particular investigator was studying. Um, Gordon's already mentioned endogenous pyrogen, the main cause of fever in animals. Uh, another would be lymphocyte acting factor. Uh, Gordon already mentioned that, which it had a certain degree of mitogenic uh, effect on thymocytes and certain T cell lines. There's catabolin, more relevant to rheumatology because IL-1 uh, can induce a variety of things relevant to rheumatoid arthritis, including collagen, uh, dis cartilage destruction, and uh, prostaglandin synthesis. And it has actions, uh, it was realized that these are all manifestations of the same basic molecule, basically which acts on virtually every uh, organ system in the body. And most of its actions can be rationalized as responses to infection or injury, promoting trafficking of neutrophils and monocytes to the affected site, initiating cleanup of damaged tissue, subsequently promoting repair, inducing behaviors such as fever be uh, and sickness behavior, withdrawal from social interactions, loss of appetite, uh, sleep, and so on to promote recovery, and so on. And because, perhaps because of its widespread activities, IL-1's been implicated in a number of different human diseases. I'll address each one of these later, but first we ought to talk about the molecules that are involved. So it was a big surprise when IL-1 was initially cloned to discover that not just one, but actually two molecules possessed this activity. They were termed IL-1-alpha and IL-1-beta. Uh, in addition to finding two different IL-1 molecules, it was also surprising to find that they shared only about 25% amino acid identity. They do, however, fold into the same three-dimensional structure, which allows them to bind to the same receptor molecule. And this receptor signals via activation of various serine threonine kinases and subsequently transcription factors. Here's a, a graphic description of the signaling complex. I want, signaling is initiated when IL-1 binds to its receptor uh, through its three immunoglobulin domains and the extracellular portion. And that IL-1, IL-1 receptor complex subsequently recruits a second protein called the accessory protein. The accessory protein doesn't bind to IL-1 on its own. It only binds once the IL-1 receptor, IL-1 complex has been formed. But it's this heterotrimeric complex of the two receptor subunits and the IL-1, uh, which brings together the two cytoplasmic domains of receptor and ACP. And it's those two, that cytoplasmic domain dimer, which is able to initiate the downstream signaling. So um, as a consequence of binding to the same receptor, IL-1-alpha and IL-1-beta have identical biologic activities. And so the question arises, why are there two different forms of IL-1? And the reason seems to be that the expression patterns differ. They can be induced by different stimuli and they can be expressed in different cell types. And one significant difference is that IL-1-alpha is present constitutively at high levels in skin and other, certain other epithelial cell types and at lower levels in most other cells, whereas IL-1-beta is synthesized only upon stimulation. And a consequence is that, of this is that cells that die by necrosis due to injury, for example, from ischemia or burns or other trauma, um, can release preformed IL-1-alpha from the cells, which then acts as an alarmin to initiate protective and repair processes. So neither IL-1-alpha nor IL-1-beta has a signal peptide and they're not released from cells via the standard secretion pathway through the endoplasmic reticulum. The IL-1-alpha that's present constitutively in cells remains mostly intracellular, although a small amount is present on the cell surface, and it can signal in this form. IL-1-alpha is initially synthesized as a 271 amino acid precursor, and it does have biologic activity in this form. However, when it's released upon cell death, any of a number of different proteases that are potentially present in the inflammatory milieu around that dying cell can remove the N-terminal 100 or so amino acids 
uh, from the full length precursor leading to a so-called mature form, which has significantly higher specific activity. IO1-beta, on the other hand, is typically made only after an inflammatory stimulus. It's made in much greater abundance than IO1-alpha, mostly by monocytes and macrophages. And unlike IO1-alpha, IO1-beta has zero activity in its 269 amino acid precursor form. In order to gain activity, it requires removal of the N-terminal 116 amino acids by, protease, by the protease caspase 1 in a complex and highly regulated multi-protein assembly called the inflammasome. The inflammasome is a fascinating topic and uh, it's uh, had a huge amount of research in recent years and I am not gonna go into it any further than this, except to say that there are multiple different inflammasomes and they can be activated by a wide variety of signals, including those that might come from various pathogens, including DNA in the cytosol, toxins made by bacteria or other bacterial proteins or pathogen proteins such as flagellum, a lot of different types of crystals, uh, crystals of sodium urate to uric acid, we know that to be a trigger for gout, um, cholesterol and saturated fatty acids, which clearly have relevance to um, cardiovascular disease as well as oxidized LDL, uh, reactive oxygen species found uh, in a, uh, certain stressful conditions, Inhale toxins such as asbestos and silica, silica particles, which are obviously relevant to lung disease, and amyloid beta, which we all know is found in abundance in um, Alzheimer's disease and other uh, dementias. So caspase 1 is the enzyme that uh, normally matures IL 1 beta, and in the process of uh, IL 1 processing in the inflammasome, um, this also leads to cell death, and cell death is what allows the release of IL-1 beta into the extracellular medium. So we've just seen that generation of biologically active forms of IL-1 is a highly regulated process. <clears throat> IL-1's activities are so potent and so widespread, however, <clears throat> excuse me, that it makes sense that there should be a regulator that can tame the activity of the molecule even after it's been made. And that's where Bill Aaron comes into the picture. Gordon told you in great detail about the experiments that led Bill to understand that there was um, actually an inhibitor of IL-1 <coughs> that was made under certain circumstances by cell types such as monocytes or macrophages and led him initially eventually to be able to clone this molecule with the uh, in collaboration with scientists at Synergen. I want to mention here only that uh, similar inhibitors were found by others uh, from a variety of different sources, which makes sense given that you might want an inhibitor of IL-1 in these circumstances, such as the urine of patients who were suffering from fever, urine of patients with certain uh, myelary leukemias, synovial fluid from rheumatoid arthritis patients, and serum and urine from systemic onset juvenile arthritis patients. Um, and again, Gordon's given you a brief uh, overview of the biology of IL-1 receptor antagonists, but I'll just, again, run through it quickly because it's important to the story. Um, uh, IL-1 receptor antagonist is a member of the same family as IL-1-alpha and IL-1-beta, and it shares identity with them. But like as with IL-1-alpha and beta with each other, the identity is pretty distant. It's only 19% amino acid identity with IL-1-alpha and only 26% with IL-1-beta. Um, and yet again, it folds into the same three-dimensional structure, allowing it to bind to the same receptor molecule. IL-1 receptor antagonist is secreted via a sig signal peptide, unlike IL-1-alpha and IL-1-beta. And Bill and his collaborator Chem Gabay also discovered an intracellular splice form that exists only inside cells. It lacks its signal peptide. Um, and so it's only present inside skin and other epithelial cells, um, <clears throat> but can be released upon cell death, uh, just like IL-1 alpha. IL-1-RA is induced by IL-1, has a feedback mechanism. It's made abundantly. Uh, as Gordon mentioned, it blocks binding of IL-1-alpha and IL-1-beta to their receptor, but does not itself signal. And the reason for this is that it fails to recruit the accessory protein. And you can see that schematically in this slide, 
where IL-1 RA binds to the IL-1 receptor, but that complex is not able to interact with the IL-1 receptor accessory protein to bring together the cytoplasmic dimers and initiate signaling. Gordon also mentioned, but I'm going to repeat it because it's an it's a, um, important concept, that IL-1 receptor antagonist is the first example among proteins of a pure receptor antagonist, that is, one which binds to the receptor, blocks the binding of the agonist ligands, but has no activity on its own. And there are still very few examples of pure receptor antagonists in the literature. The best known one is actually another member of the IL-1 family called IL-36 receptor antagonist. And it blocks the signaling of cytokines called IL-36 cytokines, which are also IL-1 family members, in exactly the same way that IL-1 receptor antagonist does, by binding the receptor, blocking the action of the cytokines, and not signaling itself. So Bill discovered not only just this molecule, but also a novel and almost unique regulatory mechanism. <clears throat> so now that I've given you a lightning tour of the molecules involved in the IL-1 system, I'd like to turn to the evidence that IL-1 plays a role in human disease, which of course is the reason that so many people have spent so much time on IL-1 over the years. And the evidence comes from the types of studies listed on this slide, overexpression studies, animal models, and in more recent years, use of IL-1 inhibitors in human clinical trials. Multiple different inhibitors of IL-1 have been developed. In addition to IL-1-RA itself, which when expressed and packaged uh, for use as a drug is called anakindra, there's a molecule called relonicept, which is a form of soluble receptor which can bind and sequester IL-1, as well as multiple antibodies to IL-1-beta and IL-1-alpha. In the three molecules shown in blue on this slide, anakinra, relonicept, and kenakinumab, which is one of the anti-IL-1-beta antibodies, have all been approved by the FDA for use in treating human disease. The first set of diseases I'd like to highlight are periodic fever syndromes. As the name suggests, these are diseases that present with relapsing remitting fevers. Uh, and they're pretty, there are other symptoms that are shared among all of them, particularly rash and joint problems, although the different diseases vary in their detailed symptom pattern as well as in their severity. In many of these syndromes, they're actually pretty rare, but many of them are actually caused by gain of function mutations in the inflammasome that lead to excessive and unregulated IL-1 beta production. And as a consequence, all of them can be effectively treated with IL-1 receptor antagonist or anakinra, as well as by other uh, inhibitors of IL-1. And some of the evidence for this is shown on the next slide. Uh, here, the graph on the left shows the main daily symptom score over time with, for patients with one of these syndromes, familial cold autoinflammatory syndrome, which is triggered by lower temperatures, such as you might find in an air-conditioned room. And subjects in the block group that are plotted with the blue line started receiving the IL-1 inhibitor relonicept at this time zero, marked by the vertical line, while those in the red group got placebo. Uh, you can see that in the relonicept group, there was a very rapid decrease in symptoms to near baseline, while there was little change at all in the placebo group until after the uh, blinded portion of the study, it became open label and everybody got uh, relonicept. Oops. Um, and on the right-hand side of the slide is a, a patient from a different disease, uh, NOMID, a much more severe disease, who was treated with anakinra. The left-hand side shows you uh, various manifestations of this disease, skin rash, conjunctivitis, and meningeal inflammation of the brain before the anakinra treatment. And on the right-hand side is subsequent to treatment, and you can see that the anakinra does an excellent job of resolving all of the symptoms in this patient. Since this is a rheumatology grand rounds, let's move on to a disease rheumatologists might see, namely gout. It's well known that elevated levels of uric acid drive gout and that the elevated uric acid can be secondary to a diet rich in red meat and cheeses. I mentioned earlier that uric crystals are excellent activators of the inflammasome, as are uh, saturated fatty acids. Since you might expect that inhibition of IL-1 would be an effective treatment in gout, and indeed that's the case, uh, you can see that in the upper graph that shows the decrease in flares per year in existing gout patients 
uh, treated with uh, an IL-1 inhibitor. I think this one, yes, it's Rolanocept. Um, while on the lower graph illustrates the dose-dependent decrease in accumulative incidence of gout over several years in patients that were treated with placebo in the upper line here versus increasing doses of the anti-IL-1 beta antibody canakinumab. So clearly inhib inhibition of IL-1 is uh, effective at reducing um, flares in gout, and it's also effective at resolving flares in gout. Um, and canakinumab is approved, as you might expect then, in the European Union for the treatment of gout, but neither canakinumab nor rolanocept have been approved by the FDA in this country for gout. And the reason is shown on the next slide. And that is that IL-1 inhibition in many studies leads to a decrease in average neutrophil count of 50% or greater. Uh, this is the best documented example I found in the literature, and it's the most dramatic. But we should note that not, neutropenia is not seen in all studies. And where it is seen, it's usually transient. But nevertheless, along with the neutropenia, there is an increase in the number of serious infections as a frequent adverse event that's associated with IL-1 inhibition. And, <laughs> excuse me, this may be a consequence of the neutropenia. An alternative hypothesis uh, for the increase in serious infections is that I-1 inhibition actually masks the early presenting symptoms of infection uh, so that there's a delay in treatment. Either way, the increase in infections has been a significant concern for regulators and has present, prevented uh, approval of I-1 inhibitors, at least in, for preventive purposes, um, in instances such as gout, and as I'll show you an even more dramatic example in the next couple of slides. And here, I'm gonna to turn to cardiovascular disease. And um, we know that cholesterol lowering agents have seen great success in reducing events, uh, reducing rates of major, major cardiovascular events. And yet, elevated cholesterol only accounts for about half of the risk for heart attack and stroke. And the hypothesis has been advanced, most notably by Paul Ridker at Harvard, that inflammation is the agent accounting for the other half of the risk. Ridker hypothesized that IL-1 might be the relevant driver of that inflammation since IL-1 has a number of actions that are relevant to cardiovascular disease, uh, increasing best, uh, white blood cell adhesion to vessel wall, stimulating growth of vascular smooth muscle, uh, promoting coagulation and so on. And um, Ritker designed a trial called CANTOS uh, to see whether inhibiting IL-1 would inhibit systemic inflammation, which he measured by levels of the acute phase molecule C-reactive protein, and whether inhibiting IL-1 would also reduce the incidence of major cardiovascular events. The CANTOS trial enrolled 10,000 patients who were elevate, at elevated risk of heart attack or stroke because they'd already had a heart attack or stroke, and in addition, who had demonstrated elevated levels of systemic inflammation uh, measured by CRP. Um, and the subjects were given either the anti-IL-1 beta antibody canakimumab or placebo every three months for an average of three and a half years. And here are the results. There was about a 15% increase in myocardial infarction and stroke over the course of the study in subjects given the IL-1 inhibitor compared to placebo. Uh, this was the primary outcome measure and it was clearly met, even though, uh, and we should note that there were no changes in uh, various lipid levels and all the patients had pretty much an average, uh, the LDL was 82, well within the normal range previously. So reducing inflammation by inhibiting IL-1 did indeed have a significant reduction in heart attack and stroke incidence. However, there was a corresponding increase in the rate of serious and fatal infections in the population that got canakinumab. So that the net difference in survival between the canakinumab and placebo groups was zero. Now, uh, they went on, the authors went on to do uh, a variety of post hoc analyses, and they showed that in the half of the patients whose inflammation was reduced to the greatest extent, demonstrated either here by reduction in IL 6 levels or in other analyses by reduction in CRP, there was an even greater reduction in cardiovascular mortality, 50% or more, 
as well as a corresponding decrease in total mortality. But uh, because this post hoc analysis was not pre-specified in the trial design, the FDA was unable, unwilling to approve canakinumab for cardiovascular disease prevention because of safety concerns. Well, you can imagine that a study, data from a study as large as Cantos would be a gold mine. And indeed, it's been queried for multiple other disease outcomes as well. And this slide shows one of the more dramatic ones. Namely, there's a two thirds, the, the participants in the canakinumab trial showed a two thirds drop in the incidence of lung cancer cases in the group that was treated by, with the anti-IL-1 beta antibody compared to the placebo group. And, but interestingly, this drop in lung cancer was only in lung cancer. The incidence of other types of cancer did not change. So one hypothesis to explain this is to reflect back on the, the knowledge that several inhaled environmental toxins such as asbestos or silica particles um, are known to be good activators of the inflammasome. And it's possible that components of cigarette smoke can do the same. It's been established for years that chronic inflammation drives a number of different cancers. And so perhaps an elevation in IL-1 levels induced by cigarette smoke is a mechanism by which smoking contributes to the development of lung cancer. Regardless of the mechanism, however, this finding is clearly of interest and there are a number of clinical trials going on right now to look at whether IL-1 inhibition might be beneficial either for prevention or treatment of lung cancer. Let's get back to rheumatology and talk about osteoarthritis. There's a huge amount of evidence that IL-1 is a major driver in at least some portion of the osteoarthritis population. And examples are listed on this slide. I'm only gonna talk about two different findings. First, it's been shown that patients who have elevated levels of IL-1 in their peripheral blood, leukocytes, show higher levels of pain and greater rates of progression than do patients with normal levels of IL-1. And second, as you can see in this graph, subjects in the Cantos trial who were treated with canakinumab had a significant decrease in the number of joint replacements that were needed over the course of the trial. So the question becomes, why aren't IL-1 inhibitors being used as disease-modifying agents in osteoarthritis? And some of you may be aware that these trials have already been done and that IL-1 inhibition was not found to be a benefit. But the problem with those trials, however, is that none of the existing IL-1 inhibitors is suitable for treating osteoarthritis. The reason is that a lot of the IL-1 seen in OA comes from chondrocytes and a lot of its relevant actions occur on chondrocytes. So that is to say that it, its actions occur entirely within the cartilage. And so if an IL-1 inhibitor is going to be able to be effective in osteoarthritis, it has to be able to get into the cartilage. And almost all of the trials looking at whether IL-1 inhibition is beneficial in OA have been done with antibodies to either IL-1 beta or to both IL-1 beta and IL-1 alpha or to the anti-IL-1 receptor and it has been well established for almost 50 years that antibodies penetrate cartilage very poorly, if at all. So these trials were never gonna succeed because um, the uh, antibodies that were being used could never actually get to one of the high, most highly relevant locations for inhibiting IL-1. The only inhibitor which is available at present for IL-1 that can readily enter the cartilage is anakinra, but anakinra has a second a different problem in the context of OA, namely that its half-life is only four hours. And so in order to achieve therapeutic concentration, it needs to be dosed daily. But in reality for osteoarthritis, it also needs to be given intraarticularly, both in order to achieve sufficient concentration in the joint, as well as to avoid the systemic, the problem with infections that is seen with systemic uh, use of IL-1 inhibitors. Um, and clearly daily intraarticular injections are not feasible for the general osteoarthritis population. So until an IL-1 inhibitor is developed, either uh, some means of extending the half-life of anakinra while keeping it small enough to enter the cartilage, or some other type of IL-1 inhibitor that uh, can avoid, maybe be given systemically, but avoid the uh, problem of infections, inhibiting IL-1 in osteoarthritis is gonna have to be, gonna have to wait. Uh, finally, given the times, we should talk about uh, COVID-19. 
Now, clearly this is a disease with a complex pathology that's not fully, yet fully understood. However, those patients who get severely ill demonstrate something resemble the classic cytokine storm symptoms. And in other instances of overly exuberant immune responses, such as seen in macrophage activation syndrome, or following therapy with CAR T cells, inhibition of IL-1 has been useful. In fact, it even made the New York Times today in the context of uh, cytokine storms. And a number of physicians have asked whether anakinra might be helpful in treating COVID-19. Here's the largest study that's been published to date, a case series of 29 consecutive patients suffering from significant respiratory distress and having markers of hyperinflammation, such as high levels of ferritin or CRP. These patients were given very high doses of anakinra on top of the usual standard of care in that hospital. And the outcomes compared to standard of care alone that had been used on the 16 previous patients they treated. The graph shows survival over time with standard of care alone in uh, blue and added anakinra in red. And clearly, despite the limitations in trial design here, there was a, a definite benefit to inhibiting IL-1 uh, with anakinra in these severely ill COVID-19 patients. So there are a number of other indications for which there's significant evidence of IL-1 involvement. And um, I've listed a number of those on this particular slide. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, I don't have time to discuss these today, but I've elaborated on them a little bit in the backup slides. And I'm assuming that these slides will be available after the talk for anybody who's interested. And if not, you can send me an email. I'll be happy to provide them to you. Here's my email address and uh, thanks for listening. So Dr. Sims, it does look like there's a question from Dr. Mustelin in the Q&A box. Um, and Thomas asked whether it would make sense to restrict the inhibition of IL-1 to the joint. Is anybody doing that? And uh, Thomas, as you may well know, uh, some of my former colleagues, Chris Gable and Roy Black and I uh, tried to do that for a number of years. Um, by making a derivative of IL-1 receptor antagonist that actually binds tightly to collagen and with the hope that that would enable it to um, migrate to the joint, reside in the joint for an extended period of time. And in fact, we demonstrated that our molecule did reside in the joint for an extended period of time. Um, and that could well be a very effective therapy for osteoarthritis. Um, but for multiple reasons, which you will appreciate having to do with um, intellectual property rights and um, uh, a pat conflicts uh, with different agents and so on, we were not able to um, pursue those studies. So I can't, uh, I can't directly answer the question of whether restricting IL-1 inhibition to the joint would be beneficial. And uh, here's Scott asking, saying that, uh, Scott Pollock saying canakinumab showed 45% reduction in OA joint replacement. Did it get in the joints? And that's an excellent question, given what I've just told you about the ability of antibody to, to uh, penetrate joints. And they didn't investigate that directly in that trial. Um, so I can't address that directly. It could well be that there was other inflammation uh, mediated by IL-1 that acted on other sources in the vicinity of the joint, such as on uh, synovial macrophages and other cells in that vicinity that made enough IL-1 to get into cartilage that over time, um, it had a chance to act on chondrocytes. And of course it would be unopposed by canakinumab because canakinumab would not be able to get in and block um, the action of IL-1 that had been synthesized outside of the cartilage on chondrocytes inside the cartilage. Um, but, and there may be other explanations as well, but that's certainly a, a good point, Scott, in the context of what I said about um, the ability of antibodies to penetrate cartilage. John, this is Gordon. Uh, one of the things that we didn't talk about is rheumatoid arthritis. The uh, Woody Emlin and others of our ilk will recall going to meetings in the 70s and seeing uh, and 80s, seeing diagrams of the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis with 
multiple arrows and multiple cells and multiple cytokines. And from my perspective, there was kind of a race going on between IL-1 and TNF-alpha as to who was the, the more pertinent uh, inflammatory mediator. And so uh, certainly there was great hope with the cloning of IL-1 receptor antagonists that it would work in rheumatoid arthritis. And unfortunately, uh, the early clinical trials did not show the kind of benefit that they had hoped for. And, and so it kind of fallen out of favor for treating RA. Is, is that because of the short half-life or it's, the, it's, quite, it's sort of the wrong inhibitor? What, what's your take on that? That's a really interesting question, Gordon. And in fact, you're right that um, there was sort of a, a I won't, don't want to say two camps or a race because it wasn't anything really competitive like that, but there was a widespread belief in both that both inhibiting IL-1 as well as inhibiting TNF would be useful in rheumatoid arthritis back um, in the 1980s and early 1990s. And in, in fact, a large part of the reason for that belief was that in any rodent molecule of, if you want to say, talk about rodent molecules, and we all know that animal models are very poor mimics of human diseases in almost all cases, but we knew that less back then also. Any rodent model of arthritis, whether it's K, KBXN transfer, collagen-induced arthritis, uh, antigen arthritis, what have you, is much more effectively treated with IL-1 inhibition than it is with TNF inhibition. Um, and so that was the main basis for believing that plus the, the known biochemical actions of IL-1, uh, that IL-1 inhibition would be useful in rheumatoid arthritis. And it was a great disappointment for those of us in the IL-1 field when it turned out that IL-1 really didn't do very much for rheumatoid arthritis patients. I mean, it was certainly of some benefit, but compared to TNF inhibitors, um, it was not nearly uh, as beneficial. And no, it, that's not unfortunately due to the short half-life of anakinra because you can dose the adequate therapeutic concentrations if you simply dose sufficiently frequently. And there are other inhibitors such as the antibodies that have much longer half-lives. It's, it's just a difference in the biology and it shows you that we still don't fully understand the pathology of that disease. I will mention in this context just one other finding which I alluded to on the next to last slide, and that is that for a subpopulation of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis patients, namely that that demonstrates systemic onset, um, and I guess for their adult uh, core counterpart, those with adult onset still disease, actually IL-1 inhibition tends to be quite effective in those patients, but it's not a general finding for all juvenile arthritis, nor does it apply to rheumatoid arthritis in the adult population. Thanks, John. Okay, so it looks like that is all of the questions we have. So we will go ahead and conclude the lecture. Thank you both Dr. Sims and Dr. Starkeybaum. Great, thanks very much. Thank you, yeah.